This is Corey Rosen with the Story Podcast. Today I have on a special guest, Mr. Bradley Hawkins. After starting a career as an actor in the San Francisco Bay Area during the 1990s, Bradley Hawkins and his family moved to Lancaster in 1997 where he taught film studies, acting, and humanities courses at Lebanon High School as well as directed several stage productions from there through 2012. Now retired from teaching, Hawkins made his directorial directorial debut for the big screen in 2015 with his award-winning comedy short Roller Coaster. Hawkins is currently living his dream as a film director, screenwriter, and producer, and is the co-founder of Lancaster-based film production company, Badly Productions. The small startup film company now has three multi-award winning short films that have cumulatively won over 200 film awards with several of those being earned for Hawkins' direction, screenwriting, producing, and original music scoring. Roller Coaster and Filling In can now be seen on Amazon Prime Direct, and Calf Rope will be streamed from Pure Flix beginning on August 1st. Mr. Bradley Hawkins, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Love that thunderstorm this morning. You? Oh, I, that was great. <laughs> it was wonderful. That definitely reminded me of home. Coming so, from California originally, I didn't get to experience those here, and let, uh, uh, Pennsylvania definitely has real weather. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. There's no base like a thunderstorm. <laughs> so what inspired you to get into filmmaking? Oh, it, it's been in my blood since I was a little boy. Uh, I was a guy that where at age eight, my dad gave me a little eight millimeter, hand me down um, a film camera, a movie camera uh, that had a stop motion switch on it to where you could do uh Frame by frame animated films. Oh wow! So I was making little movies where I was moving my uh, little, uh, um, you know, Hot Wheels around mm-hmm. and uh, uh, car wrecks and things like that. So I started fiddling with that stuff at about age ten, using my younger brothers as my talent. Mm-hmm. And eventually, it was uh, neighborhood kids. So, uh, and then in high school, I made a a, a short film that uh, uh, was much higher end and. But then life hits you, and you have to go on with, uh, you know, how are you going to support yourself? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, now, after retiring from teaching, uh, I'm uh, going back to where my heart's always been uh, and having the time of my life at 65. That's great. Mm-hmm. And uh, your, your production company is called Dadly Productions. Correct. Where did that come from? Uh, it stems from uh, the first short film, professional short film that uh, I produced and wrote after teaching high school at Lebanon High School. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, it came from the the situation where my daughter was uh, doing some modeling out here in Philadelphia and uh, a few college uh, films um, and really was serious about pursuing this, so moved down to Los Angeles and had been pursuing an acting career. Um, And uh, to support her, I'd come out now and then And then uh, uh, I was encouraged after I retired from teaching to get back on the horse as an actor. I actually was, um, my career path was I was a a music director for far longer than I've been a film director. Mm -hmm. Went into uh, acting after retiring from that. Started making more money teaching acting, which inspired me to go back to college uh, late in life. Uh, They called me non-trad Brad uh, (laughs) when I graduated from um, York College of Pennsylvania. Uh, with a teaching credential, and then I landed a humanities job, which kind of took all of my life experiences into one, music, my love for film, my love for the arts, uh, and was the perfect job for me. But once retiring from that in 2012, I decided to jump back on the um, uh, horse of being an actor, because I really believe that all teachers are actors. I mean, everyone's an actor. We all act different ways Mm -hmm. around different people, that term. I mean, a, a, a toddler acts all the time to of get course. what they want. So I always was thinking that, you know, a, t- a school teacher, they have a captive audience. Uh, they have a uniform or a costume they wear. Uh, they have a script being their lesson plans. They have props. Um, and they're playing a part that isn't really them. It's a role they play, yep. you know. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, what inspired me to go back into acting and then acting morphed into directing, which leads us to Dadly Productions. My first film, uh, Roller Coaster, was spawned from a text message that my daughter sent me from LA about this horrific 
audition that she went to. And we had been looking for something to collaborate on. I'd written a short film that was way too ambitious prior to that conversation. But when she sent me that text, I said, let's hold up here. Send me an email with some bullet points of more that happened there. When she did that, I wrote back and said, this is, this is our short film. Mm -hmm. This is what we should be doing. I'll fly out to LA. I'll direct. We'll put you in the starring role. We'll find a local crew and um, uh, let's do this. Uh, so the reason Dadley came out around is that everybody else on the set calls me Bradley, uh, but I'm her dad. And she felt weird calling me dad on set. She felt weird calling me Bradley on set. So she coined the name Dadley and it stuck. So uh, now a lot of people in the film industry go, hey, Dadley, how you doing? That's funny. <laughs> so it's a way to keep um, kind of the family legacy in the name. I mean, I'm in my mid-60s. Uh, she's uh, uh, in her early 30s, and I have granddaughters. So my dream is that after I'm gone, Dadley Productions will continue through my daughter, through my granddaughters, and uh, um, be something that lives on as sort of a, um, a live-action Pixar is the way I describe mm -hmm. my brand. That's cool. So what is it like to go to L.A. and then bring people together in order for a film? This is a God thing. Uh, and I'm very open about my faith. Uh, uh, and only God could have orchestrated this. I don't believe in coincidences. I believe mm -hmm. in design. So when this plan came together, um, I had written the screenplay when I got her text message, but we didn't know what was going to happen to it. So I was actually out to L.A., uh, to be her plus one at the Oscars in 2015. Oh, really? Yeah, she was working for the Academy. She was a wrangler for talent. She'd be the one that, at, uh, when there'd be a Q&A, they would have her babysit Leonardo DiCaprio or Johnny Depp or Winona Ryder oh, until so they bring her in and out. So she was uh, able to go to the Oscars, and she had a plus one. So she invited me, and that was the best father-daughter date any dad's going to have. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's the purpose while we were out there. But while, we were, while I was out there, I got a text message, excuse me, an email from a young producer in New Jersey that uh, I was in as an actor in one of his short films. Um, and I had sent him the script to kind of get his feedback on it. Didn't hear anything about it. Frankly, forgot about Roller Coaster because my focus was all on the Oscars. Right. As we were out looking for outfits, you know, I text for me, a dress for her. I got this email and saying, hey, were you still interested in doing this roller coaster movie of yours? If so, we have people from Messiah College that are going to be out in L.A. during these two weeks. And they've got four days where they don't have anything scheduled. Can we do this? And I said, yeah, well, let's 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 do this. So the crew ended up being primarily from Messiah College all the way out here in uh, uh, Pennsylvania. We're out there in L.A. at the time. Um, and uh, that's where Sarah went to college was at Messiah as well. Oh, wow. Okay. So there were a couple people from L.A., certainly the talent, the, you know, the supporting cast was all auditioned from L.A. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was definitely a God thing for that to happen at that time, to be able to uh, collaborate and bring in graduates from Messiah who are out there doing another project. That's cool. So I've always wondered, I, I, I've always seen like, uh, for like Marvel, they're, they're filming in New York city and there's like a bunch of people. Um, there's a few, uh, cuts like that. If I remember correctly in roller coaster where it's out in LA and there's actual people walking around. Is that just you taking a camera and just recording that? And then whoever's extra is just, whoever's there is just there automatically in the film. Or do you have to like, block out that street because i know for some films they had to block out the street oh i hear what you're saying now. It, yeah okay so to answer that question it is a hundred percent shot in los angeles we did all the post-production out here in pennsylvania uh minus a score who's a former student of mine that lived in portland oregon and everything was done remotely for the scoring wow. of it um but uh it depends on the scene you're talking about no we did not have any permits uh, mm -hmm. at all. It was definitely guerrilla filmmaking. Uh, a lot, uh, a large part of it was shot in her apartment, where, which represented two different spaces. We were able to divide it up to where it absolutely looks like two different apartments. Um, and one of the associate producers, who was a graduate from uh, Messiah, had been out in L.A. longer and was working for Pop TV. 
So if you it sounds like you've seen the film, there's a portion of it that takes place at an audition, mm-hmm. and that was the top floor of Pop TV in, in in L.A. So he was able to secure that for us. In that in that world, that location, everybody there was a paid extra, so there wasn't just in, grabbing anybody you know off, that happened to be there. They were all intentional, and we ate the only ones that had the, that space that day. Anything in the traffic, though. If, they're, if they were driving by or whatever, that, none of that stage. There's also a scene where there's a parking issue that she has. Yes, right. That car behind her that she kind of bumps, that was my car, so we planted that there. Gotcha. So that, so that That's what a- I was kind of t- uh, alluding to, because there's a, there's a scene where uh, she is trying to park, or or I, I remember specifically, it's where she's raging at, at, at herself, and, and she just shots like right back here. It's <laughs> just a, really funny. So that's all of that, just gorilla, just... Yeah, Done. just out the street. That when they're running around, she has a, uh, she reverses the numbers of the addresses at the wrong space. That was just a building that I had gone in and uh, um, checked out a day before or something, and we just kind of went there on a on a Saturday or Sunday when we knew that nobody was going to be there mm-hmm. or hoped nobody would be there. Right, and it worked out that way. So that was all just in and out. They never know knew we even shot it. It's so- a is that have you? Is that the only time you've ever like gone like gorilla style? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that was that was really risky, um, and it was my first professional short, um, and we had a very limited amount of time to right. do to do much else other than that, so we lucked out. But uh, everything in my other two uh, films, of all permits and locations are secured in advance and all that. Cool. So, um, roller coaster was. Kind of, was kind of like a big break almost for, for Daddy, right? It very much was. We had no idea how it was going to be received. I had experience, you know, as a, you know, in high school and as a kid with editing. I mean, back then, editing was literally cut, right, paste, yes. you know. Uh, um, and uh, um, as a music director, you do a lot of editing as well. I, I, I arranged and composed music for the music organization that I taught. Uh, so editing is something that comes natural for me, um, but I haven't kept up with the technology for it. Mm. At the high school I taught at, I was considered the iMovie ninja when iMovie was the thing, and I created all the content for the Lebanon School District. But once Final Cut and Adobe came out, it was just too much of a learning curve to pick that up at oh, my absolutely. age. And there's everybody that's doing that well are digital natives. I'm a digital n- immigrant at my age, mm-hmm. you know, so it would... It would be silly for me to try to take on another big learning curve to learn the technology for editing digitally when I'm still an editor up here. Right. And uh, I may not know which bus- buttons to push and stuff, but you I know, know what one. I know what will work in a film. Yeah, that, that's so interesting. I, I would I would love to talk about what it's like to uh, work remotely um, before it was like ever a, like a thing, I guess. Before it was a requirement because of right, COVID, exactly, right? yeah. Right. So, what was it like to work with someone over in Portland um, in a time where I guess Zo- I maybe Zoom didn't exist. Zoom wasn't even around yeah. yet. Uh, what we were, what were we using then? Skype? I don't even remember. Skype. Okay. Yes, we were using Skype at that time. So how how does how does because the, the film scoring process is a lot different from just creating a piece. There's watching the film go by and then like having to manipulate music to fit within that. How do you do that over across like dig, digital uh, services that aren't as advanced as we have now? Because if I remember correctly, with Skype, you couldn't really even share your screen. Oh no, there was no screen. Yeah. Set. Uh, uh, no, no, that's not correct. Oh was, yeah, we were able to see each other, but no way to share a screen of what is on your screen yes. like you can with Google Meet and Zoom and that. Yeah. So. Um, our process was, first off, I hired somebody that I knew very well. And he, when he was 16, he was a drummer in the marching band I taught. He ended up, at, and then we reconnected with him in his 40s. And by that time, he was world known as a percussion uh, arranger and a, a composer. Um, and uh, there are drumsticks named after him oh, wow. now. He's a very, a very big deal. Are you familiar with drum and bugle corps at all? Uh, no, but I can be. Oh, okay, that's all right. <laughs> it's like high end, very uh, like it's like 
college marching band on steroids. I mean, it is really high level performance, uh, very athletic, very intricate music, um, state of the art. I mean, Broadway show kind of level of professionalism. Right. So um, it's like Michigan State band. Better. 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 Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, definitely better. It's uh, much more intricate than in a typical college band. You don't out go make formations. You're not keeping in a block. You're really creating beautiful movement uh, that is all like a giant mixing board on the football field. Gotcha. Uh, it's really intense. Anyway, I knew this kid very well who's now in his middle ages, um, and uh, we really trusted each other. He really respected me as a former teacher. I really respected the journey he was on. Um, so our communication was um, abbreviated just from knowing each other and, and the language really well. Mm -hmm. um, most film directors that are working with composers aren't as um, articulate with the language of music as I am. And so that really makes things move really much, much yeah, quicker. That helps a lot. So I'd be, I was able to, he would send me files. We would talk about reference music. Uh, he would send me files and I loved opening them up and uh, playing them. And uh, then I would give him a um, critique sheet on an Excel spreadsheet, you know, timed out every, so he knows every second what, I, what, what I'm feeling and things. Mm -hmm. Come back and give me another one. And uh, we only had to meet really to discuss the next section, talk that out. Gotcha. So, so much of it was done uh, from just him doing some recording in the studio, sending it to me, me giving him feedback, and then we meet to, to discuss the next block. So a lot of the, a lot of the, the meeting portions was just uh, kind of post-boarding for the, for the next part. Yeah, kind of like pre-production, yeah. you know, uh, of while he goes into production of creating uh, the scoring based on the moods that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, I would talk through with him about specific beats, what I'm wanting. Um, and uh, we just kind of uh, tweaked it from there. That's cool. Because the only time I've done film scoring was when I had, uh, I, I took in, intro to cinematography. Um, and um, film scoring for me, it's, it's completely new, but it's a lot of fun. I love, I love film. I love the scoring of film. Hans Zimmer, Michael Giacchino, uh, John Williams, all these it was so inspirational to me, yeah. but it's, it's, uh, e even, uh, oh, John Powell from, uh, how to train your dragon. Mm -hmm. uh, oh my gosh. That, that's a ter terrific score. I know, yeah. it, but it, 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 it's mind boggling. It mind blowingly boggling, uh, to think about, Oh, they have to fit a piece of music within a set amount of time. That is so hard to do. Um, when I was creating my own little short films, it, even that was like, how do I make music into, how do I fit music into this LBC ad that I was already created? How do I fit music into that? How do I, uh, granted, when I was making my own film, I could just, you know, film yeah. actually longer. Sure. Um, so it was. It but was, here you're dealing with a situation where you have picture lock. Right. There's no, uh, they've got the timeline nailed down. There is no leverage on adding a few frames. You've right. got to be able to. Spin on a dime to be able to have your emotional moods and things change within a extremely tight, limited set time. Set yeah. time. Down, to, down to frames. Frankly. Right, yeah, because yeah, it, it gets into the uh, like decimal points on BPM, yes. I'm sure. Yes. Um, and all sorts of time manipulations and time uh, meter changes. Whew. Yeah, sounds, sounds like a lot of fun, though. Yeah, when I was composing, it was by hand, you know, on on uh, you know manuscript, and then uh, before you know the home computers or anything like that were out. So, uh, um, in a lot of ways, that was uh, I don't know. I was going to say some ways it's easier, but it's not nearly as proficient as what would can be and done today. It's a lot more time consuming. Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, so, what was your next big? "Quote unquote big break in regards to Dally Productions." Yeah, well, I'm sorry, I just bumped our mic. Um, I was, as I was saying, roller coaster. We had no idea what was going to happen with it, but we put it out in the film festival circuit, and we were pleasantly surprised that that short film ended up winning 30 film festival awards throughout the nation, with our very first time out in the rodeo. And what what a lot of people don't know is, getting into a film festival is a win. Yeah, I was about to say, how do you do that? Yeah, that you had to have a really 
great film just to get accepted because there are so many filmmakers today. Right. I mean, anyone with, a with iPhone an iPhone is a filmmaker. Is a filmmaker. Right. So to it's already a huge victory to get accepted to a film festival. To win an award or more on so top of that more. is is phenomenal. So who do you do you just send emails to people or? Uh, oh no, there's a whole system. Yeah, how how does that work? There's a, a service called Film Freeway that people that filmmakers submit their films to film festivals through that um, organization, that kind of a gateway, mm -hmm. um, and then the film festivals receive your movie, review it, and they decide whether or not they want to accept it for their film festival. So I have a question about winning the awards. Um, does, cause I've always wondered, I assume that this is the case that they will let you know beforehand. And then that way you can be there at the event to receive the award. How does that work? That would be the smart way of doing it. Right. But not all of them do. What they typically will do to entice you to go is that they'll announce the nominees in advance of the festival. And then if you're nominated, you have more um, motivation Urge, yeah. to attend. Uh, to attend. Uh, so th I think the best festivals do it that way. Nobody's going to, uh, they, they, until COVID, there were no announcements. You know, even then they would announce after they'd done all their streaming or very limited screening that they could do, you know, uh, during that time. But uh, yeah. Um, you submit, and, and frankly, it's a win just to be able to go and networking as mm -hmm. well. Mm. I attended film festivals that we weren't nominated or won at, but I made great contacts in the film industry by being there and supporting other people's films. And still getting people going, I really loved your movie. It may not have won an award, but you're, oh, real, okay. you're on the right track. That's cool. So what is it like to go to somewhere you've probably never been before and then network with people you've never met before? How do, how do you and start a conversation with somebody like that. Everybody's really willing and anxious to talk about movies when you go to one of these. It's uh, almost like a, uh, I've only been to one con before, uh, but I, I'm, I'm guessing it's sort of like what that world is like where uh, everybody is really into one thing and so they're very willing and anxious to meet people and find out about things. So when somebody sees your movie and they see what you're, you're strong points are mm -hmm. they love to network about hey uh where'd you find that composer or oh your daughter is tremendous is she doing the other acting and that kind of a thing so uh but uh you have to be you have to be outgoing it's a, I was saying, yeah yeah a nightmare for me oh yeah well it's and and that's an interesting thing you, br thing you bring up because i think a lot of filmmakers would say that they are introverts and uh especially those that come from camera the technical end of it they, they know everything about talking about cameras and, you know, lighting and gear and that. Uh, and they work with talent, but aren't as comfortable talking with the talent as they are with the crew. I come from an acting background that morphed into directing and as a high school teacher and a marching band director of kids from right. uh, seventh through 12th grade. You've got to be outgoing. Uh, and so... Uh, it's really very easy for me to talk to people and uh, they seem to, um, they reciprocate when I ask them about their films and such. Good. So was your next uh, production Calf Rope? No, we had a, from, from um, Roller Coaster, um, two of the um, funders through crowdfunding that were former students and that were looking to pursue acting um, uh, kicked in enough money on Roller Coaster to warrant being executive producers on the film. It's sort of like the more you contribute, you get an IMDb credit. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know what that is? I am uh, a little bit. International Movie Database. That's sort of like, if you check imdb.com, any movie that's ever been released is going to show up on there all the way back to the silent era. And it's sort of like the one and only log that covers all professional films. Uh, um, so it's hard to get onto IMDb and getting into festivals is one, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you can't just make a movie with your friends and get accepted to IMDb, that kind of a thing. Gotcha. It's, it's gotta be seen somewhere and released that kind of a way. Is that, is that like a, an American thing or? Oh no, it's global. It's global? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, uh, these two former students who are both interested in looking into acting as a career, 
valued the idea of having IMDb credits and being associated with um, a film and also kind of a, a thank you to Mr. Hawkins, who was her teacher, and say, that's cool that he's doing this, you know, now at 55. I want to support him. Mm -hmm. I've got the means to support him at a level that others are not. And so uh, these two guys kicked in uh, significant money on roller coaster. Well, then I got this idea. These guys both want to go into acting. I'm going to try to create a script where those two guys specifically could be the leads in a movie that fits their personalities. Mm -hmm. And so I came up with the idea of this um, comedy fantasy called Filling In, which is, have you seen it? Uh, well, I just remember hearing about it from the intro. It's, as, essentially, it's a very twisted tooth fairy story. Oh, yeah, you showed a clip from that. That's right. Yeah. Right. It's a, I describe it to people, if you were to take Sons of Anarchy and The Office, put it in a blender in fairyland, that's kind of what the feel is of filling in. It was really fun, quirky um, uh, comedy short, and both of these former students from two different eras um, – uh, starred in it and uh, and financed the film because they saw the value. Hey, rather than going to film school and paying a whole bunch of money and not really having anything to show for it, I'm going to kick in money to be the star of one of Bradley's films because Bradley knows what he's doing because they saw that from Roller Coaster. Mm -hmm. So that film exceeded more than double the award recognition that Roller Coaster got. Oh wow! Uh, and it it went global where Roller Coaster stayed domestic. So uh, Roller Coaster won 30 awards domestically, filling in won 61 awards globally. And that really kind of expanded the name of Dadley Productions uh, and such. So that's what led to Tafro. It was the next project. So what, what was it like to uh, get this almost instantaneous uh, notoriety from just two films? Some ways it was really frustrating because it was so cool to have uh, my film accepted and winning awards in Australia, but not having the money to go be there to be able to support it. It'd be, mm. it'd be a $5,000 trip for me to be able to go there. And uh, as a retired high school teacher, that's too much money to be able to spend on a trip. So that aspect was frustrating, but it was still rewarding knowing that even though I can't be there, it's being enjoyed all the way around the world. You know, and so uh, I, I don't know if I answered your question or not. You were asking about how did it feel. So, Part of it was frustrating and not being able to attend them. Um, and the other was very rewarding knowing that my films have universal appeal. Mm. You know, it's uh, hitting, it seems to be my, my brand, which I do describe as live action Pixar. In other words, films that will appeal to an eight-year-old sitting next to their 88-year-old grandfather, and they'll both enjoy it for different reasons. Um, and, they're all, and there's nothing going to be, there's not going to be anything objectionable in it to where you can watch it with your kids. Family friendly as well. Yeah. Family friendly yeah. is the way I refer to it, yeah. So um, did, did that ever, when you uh, started winning all these awards, did that ever give you a sense of like fear of for the next project? Um, but, no, I've never been afraid of coming up with another idea. I mean, if I was 20 years younger, I've got so many other film ideas that I would love to come out of my head. But um, uh Calf Rope was uh, something that um, came out once I became a grandfather hmm. because it's very much a story. Frankly, it's based on my memories of my relationship with my grandfather back in the 1960s when I was a young boy of like nine. And uh, it's sort of an unusual love story between a grandfather and the grandson, very much about love and legacy. And so it's a highly personal film to me. And it seems to be striking a nerve with a lot of, um, again, multi-generationals. Uh, my five-year-old uh, granddaughter has the biggest crush on the nine-year-old that's in the, in the movie. And uh, I've had uh, 50, 60-year-old cowboys, you know, rough and tumble guys come out of a screening and go, God, fuck, you got me to tear up on that one. <laughs> you never expect it. Seems to have kind of a, um, feel, um, a field of dreams kind of vibe for men in particular, where bringing up the father-son relationships and grandfather and grandson relationships seems to be really touching, um, touching hearts. Yeah. Um, so you're also turning that into a feature film. 
Yes, uh, Calf Rope has been so successful. Uh, it was a long, that was a very ambitious short. Short is even kind of stretching it with it because it was 29 minutes long. Mm. Uh, took eight shooting days, three years to make it. Um, there's a cattle auction scene in it where there's 40 head of cattle and 50 people that are bidding on cattle in it. Uh, there's a hospital scene that's all, and all this is set in the 1960s. So it's, a, oh, it's, wow. it's very yeah. much a period piece, which requires costuming and cars and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, dressing the sets to make that period believable. And the film won awards for production design because it is so believable wow. to the point where it won awards in Texas, Arizona, and Oklahoma for best Western but we shot it all here in Pennsylvania. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's um, uh, it got finished right when COVID hit. I mean, literally the month of. And we'd already submitted to a, a bunch of film festivals because you need to budget a lot for marketing in movies. A lot of young filmmakers make the mistake of, oh, good, we got enough money to make our movie. Mm hmm. What good is that if you can't afford to get it out there to be seen? Yeah, to make a profit. Yeah, well, you, well. Need, you, you, you at least need your goal of people being able to see it to yes. happen, even if you don't make money from it. Uh, so uh, smart filmmakers know that they've got to uh, include in their budget a big chunk of chains for film festival submissions and being able to travel to them and such. How much does it typically cost to submit to a film festival? So they're tiered by timelines. If you submit your film at the uh, early bird deadline, you're paying less. Then there's the regular deadline, and then there's the late deadline, and each deadline is going to cost you more money. The range on it, most of them, the average, I'd say, starts at about 20 to $25. They can get up to as high as $85 for late. That may not sound like much. But when you're doing it multiple, multiple times, yes. a lot. And uh, any filmmaker will tell you that um, no matter how great your movie is, it's not for every film festival. Oh, for sure. Um, there's branding for the festivals and such. Um, so you can't look at not being accepted as, oh, they don't like my movie. Often they do like your movie, but they've already got another movie program that's too much like it. So they're mm -hmm. trying to keep it interesting for the audience. So in your experience, what has been the best budgeting in regards to like percentage for... Oh, yeah. Uh, as far as acceptance? As far as, as, far as uh, like budgeting out, okay, this is what pro production is going to cost. How, how much of the budget should go to that? How much of the budget should go to the marketing? For the three shorts I've done, it, uh, it kind of... Uh, I haven't really figured out that yet. That's something now leveling up from short films to features that is an absolute must. Mm -hmm. um, within the short film world, um, we we increased our budget for that incrementally the more experience I got. Uh, and so I think we, uh, the least we spent on it was like two grand and the most was like 3,500. Um, and that's a pretty good chunk of change. Yeah. Um, how much does it usually cost to, to create a short film? Um, live action that is yeah uh um well the budget on each of the three of those was the budget for roller coaster my first film was seven thousand and then the budget for um uh filling in was twenty five thousand and the budget for calf rope was twenty eight thousand so it's 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 a good chunk of change oh yeah for sure oh yeah now there are a lot of short films that uh do well that are uh made on a shoestring compared mm -hmm. to that. Um, but um, you're going to notice, a lot of people have said about Calf Rope in particular that it doesn't feel like a short film. It looks like something from a feature. Um, and that's a terrific compliment. So what's it like to uh, turn a, a quote-unquote short film, being 30 minutes long, into a, a feature maybe an hour and a half yeah. long? Yeah. Um, uh Lots of writing time. and be, during So as soon as Calf Rope the Short got released, it's always been my co-writers and my intention that this is our proof of concept mm. for a feature. So let's get that proof of concept of a feature out on the film festival so we get draw attention to it while he and I spent 18 months expanding that 30 minutes 
into a 96 page screenplay. And that was, I don't, I couldn't even tell you how many rewrites uh, I'm going to guess somewhere around 14, 15 rewrites to improve it and perfect it and get to the point where it, the screenplay for calf rope was submitted to a film festival. And the, the very first one that was submitted to just as a screenplay. And this past Sunday, it won its first screenplay award uh, for oh, wow. uh, for best let's uh, see the title best western best modern western family screenplay at a festival in uh, Electra Texas. Yeah, I, I, I watch uh, watching the uh, awards that you get. I'm li- I'm noticing they're very very specific. <laughs> um, like there's like the best western evangelical uh, award. Oh, the two well. new ones at yeah. this particular festival it is very specific. A lot of them it's just they'll only have award for best short film. Oh, gotcha. Oh, yeah. This it depends on the festival. This is this particular festival is called the Cowpokes International Film Festival. So they're completely gearing towards people who are into westerns. But gotcha. there's so many genres of westerns, and they want to applaud different styles uh, with it. Gotcha. So, um, being a Christian, what what choices do you have to make in regards to filming? Uh, in, in regards to casting, do you, is, does, does, does that play a part in um, your, I, I'm assuming it does, but how does your faith influence the way you make films? Um, so this all start with Roller Coaster. With Roller Coaster, out of the blue, I've got this producer here in New Jersey contacting me saying, I got a team coming out there. Uh, would you still want to shoot it? Um, I didn't design that or Mm -hmm. uh or reach out for that that came to me so uh, i saw that as a god thing and they weren't not everybody that came out some were for messiah but some were friends and uh i my feeling is god's going to bring the people to you that he wants to be involved whether they're christians or not Mm -hmm. and as a christian my job is to try my purpose is to um reflect christ as much as i can whether they're Christians or not, they're working with. So no, it's not a requirement at all for you to be a Christian to be in a, a Dadly Productions film. It, a lot of Christians are attracted to working with me, mm-hmm. but a lot of non-Christians are attracted to being connected with a filmmaker who's um, making good movies. Successful, yeah. yeah. So what's um, some next projects for you? Uh, well, okay, so... Along with Calf Rope the Feature, which is now, um, we're getting it on the film festival circuit as a screenplay. Simultaneously, this is another very much a God thing, and I, I remember I wanted to be sure to tell you about it. Mm. Another project came my way that I was not soliciting at all for. My focus was um, expanding Calf Rope the Short into Calf Rope the Feature, and that was my sole, I saw that as my purpose. Yes. Then out of the blue, I received this box in the mail from Georgia, and I don't know anybody in Georgia. Um, and as I opened it up, inside this box was a very nicely handwritten letter. Uh, uh, no, excuse me. It was a novel that was autographed on the front page with this handwritten uh, letter. Uh, some information about Cowboys for Christ and two engraved horseshoes. One of them engraved with calf rope on it, stamped in, and uh, that was gold, and then there's a black one that was stamped in with Bradley Hawkins in the bottom. That's cool. And I didn't ask for any of this. I didn't know who this person was, but I looked up his name. It was somebody who had been following me on Instagram, and he had been, you know, uh, checking out what's been going on with my career and sent this unsolicited box of stuff, which included a novel of his. So I was like, okay, I know what he wants. Right. He wants me to read his novel and see if there's a movie in it. And I got to tell you, I hate reading unless it's a screenplay. I mean, as a retired teacher, I've done enough reading, I right. feel like. Um, but I, it was so gracious of him to go to the level of sending me these super cool horseshoes that I, I said, I got at least the th- first three chapters. And then Ryan back and said, I've started it. And uh, I'll get back to you and then and hopefully you forgot about it. <laughs> well, I got three chapters into it. And actually, after the first chapter, which was like six pages, it's like, dang, this is different. And that almost feels like a scene in a movie. Right. And then uh, went on the next chapter, it was like 10. And it just made me, who, who, a person who doesn't like to read, 
feel like, okay, I can do this. You know, I got to the third chapter and there was this new character in this. I stopped. I ran out to tell my wife. I go, I know why he sent this to me. He wants this to be a movie. This needs to be a movie. So I then reached out to him, thanked him for it, and go, we should meet. So we started using Google Meet during COVID and uh, uh, talking about it. And we spent the next 18 months. He'd never written a screenplay. So had taken his terrific faith-based novel, flat out evangelical faith-based novel, set in the 1880s. And uh, the two of us worked it out to create uh, a feature screenplay from his novel. It's winning awards now as well. It won its oh, wow. second awards as a screenplay. So I have two feature films that are completely, they're in development now. We're at the stage where we're looking for a lot of money to make features. Um, and those two projects are in the works as in development. Your question was, though, anything else coming up? Um, yeah, but now I have more questions. Yeah. Um, what is the What are some of the challenges that come from a feature film as opposed to a short film? Um, well, financing is the biggest challenge. Yeah. There are challenges in a short film genre that you don't have in the features. Oh, and yeah? it's really hard to tell a compelling story in less than, you know, 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. And to be limited to uh, a lot of the film festivals now are shortening their limit time limit on it. When it roller coaster came out, the average time limit for shorts was 30 minutes. Oh, wow. When filling in came out, the average time limit was 20 minutes. So it's getting shorter and shorter. When, when calf rope came out, that the average time limit was 15 minutes. It's so that they could bring in more programming to a show. Mm hmm. So that made it really hard for people. They had to really love calf rope to take a 29 minute short when they could have two shorts that meet their 15 time limit instead. And, um, but the quality of calf rope didn't interfere. It, it won over 140 awards Jeez. for that film on its own globally again. So the challenges for making a feature are, I'm having to learn to level up from $28,000 movies to movies that'll have at least one, if not two more zeros. Oh, uh, oh no, actually two to three more zeros. Oh, after wow. Them. Oh, yeah. Uh, I fully expect calf rope to cost anywhere from a quarter of a million to up to just under two million to do it right. Wow. Yeah. So what's it like to, because managing a short film in regards of people is probably a lot easier than managing a oh. feature. Oh, yeah. It's like, uh, you know, roommates almost versus, a, you know, a, uh, you're being a CEO at that point. Oh, absolutely. It is like having a company. Um, you know, um, like my, your, my, like my, my company. Sorry. It's like you're owning your own company. <laughs> I, well, I, I, essentially any movie is a new business mm -hmm. and it, it needs to be treated as a business. So yeah, there's an army of people that need to be involved when that kind of money's involved. Um, and it's going to cost you more for talent and for crew. Um, nobody's going to do anything for free for a feature. You know, I mean, it's very rare when that happens. You have to be, have it protected legally. There's so many things that are involved that, that raise the, the budget of a feature. Um, so um, locations, you know, are, are going to cost you. And, uh, yeah. uh, and the more, the more uh, complicated and intricate your scenes are, are going to increase the time to shoot the movie. Because making a movie is all about the cost per day. Mm. You know, it's like you figure out where you're going to be, what are you trying to shoot, how long is it going to take to do it, so how many people are you having to pay, and then how many days is that movie going to take. So you multiply each day, and that's what it comes down to. I'm sure you had to factor in human error. Oh, absolutely. Well. Oh, everything. You got meals, travel time, uh, rehearsals. Up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Retakes. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So that's why um, Calf Rope the Short was shot in like seven or eight days. I fully expect Calf Rope the Feature to, to be close to 40 days uh, to shoot it. And then so multiply a professional crew and cast times 40 per day. That's how you a movie gets to be, you know, half a million, million dollars. How do you choose the location to shoot at? Um, so for Calf Rope, we shot everything right here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Lakeshore and Lebanon, Pennsylvania, and it passed for Texas, Oklahoma, uh, and that area mm -hmm. from southwestern states. 
So I'm completely confident that we can shoot calf rope right here again at many of the same locations we use that for it and the ones that we have added to it. My my quest is to shoot it completely here in South uh, Central Pennsylvania. Is that for, uh, what reason is that? Because I can do it le far less expensively. I know people here, people, places that where the short was shot before, would I know would love to be involved with the feature and knowing that they'd be paid this time to mm -hmm. use their house or whatever, um, I doubt if anyone's gonna turn it down. And there's been a really sense of community behind calf rope also. So many locals were involved. A good story there is that there's a lot, there's several antique American cars that would have been around in the 60s, which means cars from the 40s through the 60s because of people having older cars. It's acceptable, yeah. Right. Um, so when it came time to finding cars for that, it was so heartwarming. Uh, when we find a car we'd want, the people that would own it would ask, literally ask, so how much is it going to cost me to have the car, your, my car in your movie? Thinking they were going to get charged for it, not realizing, no, this works the other way around. We're paying we'll pay you. you. Yeah, I mean, That's so funny. Yeah. So we got all the cars volunteered. They were just happy that they didn't have to pay for it. But now with the feature, everyone will get a paycheck uh, for whatever it is they need to, to contribute to it. That's so wild. That I also want to be part of the vanguard of bringing um, major motion pictures, narratives to our area. It's been, you know, we're, we're going to be very fortunate that a film is going to be coming out that was shot here, I believe, last year called Brave the Dark. Yep. And it should be released sometime next fall. That's terrific. With Jared Harrison, my goodness, that's, uh, he's a great actor. But there really hasn't been a feature of that level since Witness from 1984 with Harrison Ford. That was the last. Have you even heard of that? I have not. Check it out. That was a big movie uh, in 1984, starred Harrison Ford. And, but there hasn't been anything of that scale between them. So I'm so thrilled about Brave the Dark coming out next year. And I want to be part of that vanguard of bringing that level of films to our area. And it's, it's so interesting because Lancaster is like a really great spot to bring films because there's so many actors. Well, you know, you got, granted, theater and film are different. But there's so much overlap that it would be almost unwise to not take advantage of that. Really, it's not about the talent. It's about the terrain. Right awesome. here, the, the, you, could, you travel 25 miles, and it's like you're in a different world. Yeah. For example, for calf rope, I had, no, I, I had been living out here for 20 years. I had no, when it came time to go, knowing there was going to be a rodeo scene, I had to Google, are there any rodeos in Pennsylvania? And brrr, within 40 miles of my house, there's a rodeo that I went to, and that's where we shot the cattle auction scene. And then from that, I met the young man that played the young boy in it. He lived within three miles of that ranch, and his parents had built him an arena for him to practice being a rodeo champ. Because that, that kid who was 12 was the Pennsylvania State Junior Rodeo Champion when we shot the movie. Oh, my. And there's a whole other world that's here. Then you have the Amish community, you know, uh, and then you drive two hours or less and you're in Baltimore or Philadelphia. Right, yeah. So, yeah, it's just the variety of locations here in this area are really unmatched. I mean, I've done a lot of travel throughout the country. We are blessed to live in one of the most beautiful parts of North America for sure. I mean, moving from California to here was like moving into a Norman Rockwell painting. Uh, it's just so Americana. And uh, I really love that about this area. That's cool, man. So, um, next upcoming project, you have a few, a few other shorts coming out? Yeah, or? so um, uh, I have these two features that my, my top priority is moving those forward and learning to level up from short films to features, which is a huge learning curve. But I've had it on my heart before being in the director's chair on something with that kind of a budget. One more round to give me some more practice, uh, experience, meet new talent that might get carried on over to the feature. And so, yeah, I have a short film that uh, we, uh, just got greenlit this week, actually. And it's a film called Night Voices. Uh, and I'm really excited about it. It'll be uh, a shorter short. We're aiming for that 15-minute time limit. Uh, and it's very different from anything else I've done before. Um, it's the darkest film that I will have ever done and simultaneously the most evangelical short I've ever done. 
the contrast between dark and light in that are going to be stunning. Um, and it's also the most dialogue heavy film I've had because um, this really takes place in the world of a radio station with one actor basically carrying the film. Mm -hmm. um, and the others are voice actors coming in with different personalities that uh, uh, affect this guy's life. It's very much a, a, a long monologue, almost. Uh, monologues, I would monologues. say. Monologues, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, so it's kind of about this guy who's like this DJ who's down on his luck. He's hating life, mm -hmm. and he gets an unexpected call at 3 in the morning that changes his life. Yeah, it's... Um, is it okay if I mention that I got to get to see it? Get to, like, That's not out yet. What, uh, what do you mean? Like, I uh, got to read part of it at the class. Is that okay? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, for, for those that don't know, uh, we know each other from. Yes. Yeah, so I, from the intro to cinematography class, uh, Bradley came in as as a substitute for one day for our teacher, and uh, he gave us an early copy of the of the script to just read through and. Uh, kind of like workshop a little bit. Yeah. And um, and uh, we if I correct me if I'm wrong, but we also got a chance to like manipulate the script a little bit to make yeah. our own kind of thing. Yeah, to, as a practice of uh, what what goes into a screenplay. We we you you saw the screenplay to roller coaster, which yep. there was virtually no dialogue on, mm -hmm. and then the contrast between that, which is very dialogue heavy. Um, and so yeah. Yeah, it was it was super interesting to uh read something that was so dark and very detailed about it as well mm -hmm. uh and and then just have this really awesome ending mm -hmm. that it, it's very much pixar in live action uh, if pixar were to go just a bit darker yep um so it was really fun to to watch and, and to and i can't wait to see from its start from that that uh, correct me if i'm wrong but that was an early draft or was that uh, about midway? Midway draft, yeah, yeah. And then having uh, to see the final product, yeah, uh, will be uh, really cool. Yeah, I'm really excited about it because it's going to uh, bring a lot of interesting challenges cinema cinematically with the um, the bulk of it taking place just in a recording studio. Uh, you do see images of the person calling in from their world, but not very often. And we intentionally don't see the face of the person who's calling in till the very end so that you, we force the audience to listen. To, to listen. Mm -hmm. But what we do, the film is going to be cinematic in the sense of the person we're watching in the film is reacting to what he's hearing, just like the audience reacts to what they're seeing and hearing. So it's really going to put the audience in the seat mm -hmm. of the DJ of what is coming to him. So it means really creative angles to be shooting from. We're definitely going to be focusing on eyes. There's just a different expressions that will pop up. And that's all we'll need to be able to tell how this conversation unexpectedly is changing his heart. So just a lot of close-ups and a yes. lot of a lot of good meticulous acting. Yes. I'm sure. Yes. Oh, we got a we got a great actor in it. He's the star from Calf Rope who won several awards for best actor uh, and uh, it was um uh, written as a vehicle for him to star in. Cool, that's that's awesome. Um, and so you also have uh, uh, Wrangled. Yes, Wrangled was the rest Western I was telling you about uh, that I got the novel and the horseshoes. Mm. What we called, that, that novel was called The Trail Ends in Texas. The screenplay we adapted from that novel is called Wrangled. And that's the um, faith-based Western that is at the same stage as Calf Rope, the feature screenplay is. So we don't know which one's going to get greenlit first. Mm -hmm. um, Calf Rope uh, is de done very well at Christian film festivals and family film festivals. Um, but it's not really a faith-based movie. It's more of a wholesome film, much more like a Pixar film. The feature is going to uh, ex uh, show more of my um, faith in it, but still very subtly. Mm -hmm. The Wrangled is going to churches are going to love it because um, and uh, because it is clearly evangelical. It's sort of a um, uh, prodigal son story type of story. Um, but within the Western world, uh, my goal is to make that film uh, very um, 
reachable to non-Christians um, by not having it be Bible thumpy. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, but the idea of there being God fearing people, it's more accepted from that genre because right. you know these it's people, Western. yeah, people moving east to try to survive, they 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 have to rely on a higher source to survive. Mm-hmm. So it's not unusual to see a little, a little white church in there or a pastor walks through or something like that. So it's going to be accepted in that sense. But the way I describe what we're doing with Wrangled and why I love this is that rather than trying to convert a non-Christian to becoming a Christian after watching a 96-minute movie, we just want to be planting some seeds and then get out of the way and let right. God do with that what he will. So there's been kind of this uh, a movement for, for like Christian media in general where it's not as Bible-thumpy as it used to be because – the joke is about pure flicks is that it's all just Bible thumpy Christian movies that aren't really as good as, as people make it out to be uh, into this more subtle, uh, just planting seeds and more, uh, focusing on yeah. story more than, um, and quality. Yes. Rather than, uh, the mission of telling everybody about Jesus. And, uh, uh, so yes, I'm excited to see how, uh, faith-based moves, movies are improving quickly. It's really a very new genre, to be mm-hmm. honest with you. You mean, I mean the yes, there were Bible movies back in the 1950s, but that was a those were big epic Bible films that and that was a different world and different audience back yes. then. Um, uh, churches are losing members left and right now in the 21st century, mm-hmm. um, and uh, uh, you know so. Uh, a new approach is needed. needed, you know, for new generations. And uh, so I'm excited about being part of that as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, actually, Calf Rope is going to be on Pure Flix, but it's nothing like what you would expect. Exactly, yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's part of that pushing the envelope to something different. Right. It, from uh, my experience with Pure Flix, it's either a Christian comedy, which is sometimes funny, or <laughs> uh, the, like, the, the, there's there's some on there that are really heartbreaking, honestly. Oh, absolutely. Uh, um, oh, what's the name? There's a tri- time travel one where mm. they go into the future and they realize what it's like with, without people hearing Jesus loves you yeah. or love love another as you love yourself. And and uh, that one was incredible. Or the oh, I keep forgetting these movies. But but Pure Flix has yeah, really it's, grown it's, up. Yeah, they it's, have. It's a they it's have. a it's a very different thing than when it. You know, again, it's a new it's a new genre, mm-hmm. and there's a new there's new support for it that is growing and improving, because you know when a, you know every faith based movie I believe is well intentioned. Yes, they're not always well executed. Yes, the execution is definitely improving. So I'm very honored and proud that uh, Calf Rope is going to get s- streamed on Pure Flix, um, and uh, would be thrilled if uh, they were to pick up the feature. Um, and, uh, and wanted in on that wrangled as well. It's, it's the Christian media has definitely improved from like veggie tales all the way up. To <laughs> I, I still love veggie tales. I <laughs> disliked veggie tales very much. Oh, well, that's fair. My granddaughters love it. So I, maybe it's, maybe it's an age thing. I it was know. scary for me. There was, oh. there, there was a uh, times like, um, there's, there's one scene where uh, the asparagus people yeah. um, they're they're singing about David and how they want to kill him and it's 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 the most creepy animation ever while they're singing that they were gonna kill uh, I think it's Daniel actually did I say David I meant Daniel um, it, it's so creepy and then there's a chocolate factory one with, with it's uh, Meshach or I forget what, the, what what they call him but it's Meshach Abednego. Uh, and oh, what's the last? What's the, the last? The one? three guys going the three into guys fire. Going to fire. Yeah, it puts in a chocolate factory, and I'm like, that's terrifying. I'll never want to eat chocolate ever again. <laughs> um, uh, I've never heard that reaction to Veggie Tales before, but uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have another uh, script in the works. Is a book drive. Book drive is done. Done. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, it's, um, but uh, I don't know when it's going to get done because um, I I'm already pushing myself by. Uh, going into production on another short while I'm simultaneously two developing features, two yeah. features. So I'm kind of stretched. Kind of what I'm thinking about Book Drive, which, I, again, I love the screenplay. It may be something that where I'll, I'll, push, I'll step back and executive produce 
and let a new young director come in and work mm. underneath me and be less involved with it. I absolutely love the story. Um, uh, very redemptive, not a faith-based, but redemptive, which uh, hits similar ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, that may be 10 years away uh, at a different stage of my life. Gotcha. So rounding out our, our time here, sure. Um, there are some generic questions I'd like to sure, ask Sure, absolutely. Uh, so as Christians, we, we worship God, right? Absolutely. What is worship to you? Um, really good. That's a very good question. Uh, it's a mul it's multiple things. It isn't just going to church on Sunday, that's for sure. It's not just singing with the choir. That's a form of worship. Going is a form of worship. Filmmaking is a form of worship. Mm -hmm. Relationships is a form of worship. We're all meant to, who uh, when we accept Christ, to be light and to allow the Holy Spirit to talk through us, to lead us, uh, to ref so that people, when they see us, they see something different about us and may be attracted to that. So um, uh, worship is um, allowing God to use you the way he sees, the way he created you as somebody that is an adopted child of his. Okay. Well, uh, so what are some ways that your faith has been challenged throughout your career? It's increased dramatically from challenges in the sense the roller coaster came together pretty easily filling in bam we went into production and that within months calf rope was a whole nother thing and i'm so grateful it took longer to do it because it made me rely on god more for every little thing that happened and i saw him at work in so many ways again i don't believe in coincidence i believe in design mm -hmm. just like when i found this rodeo 40 miles away at that rodeo i heard uh I was told that there'd be uh, at this arena, there'd be a rodeo there that Sunday. And at that rodeo was the kid who ended up being uh, the boy that's in it. And he was actually related to the guy that owned the arena. Not all these connections that are just Too cannot be yeah. coincidence, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, just how the funding came in, how, you know, just needed to trust God for big funding for me at that time. At 28000 was a lot of money. You know, uh, it's a lot of money to me today. Right. But what it's done, it's increased my faith in if this is, this is going to happen under God's direction, he's got to be the executive producer on any project that I'm executive producer on mm -hmm. in order for it to really happen. And uh, I know it'll happen in his time. So um, winning all these awards, uh, having so many challenges, what keeps you grounded um, as a person? Yeah, uh, that is becoming, uh, being more faithful with my uh, time with God. Uh, uh, I'm reading the Bible more than I ever have in my life um, and, uh, and getting fed spiritually from my church, which is LCBC, from Rick Warren, from Saddleback on the radio, uh, from the Bible app, uh, from a devotional that I have. Uh, and so keeping God in my life daily is grounding me for sure. And absolutely being married to uh, uh, the most beautiful woman there is uh, <laughs> inside and out who uh, grounds me as well. What's it like to balance that relationship with not only your, your spouse, but your family with, within your work? Uh, I learned too when I was a teacher. I learned that if you can, uh, teachers can absolutely work seven days a week and not get everything done. Yes. And so I lear learned early on, I need to give one day where I'm not teaching because it's just like putting grains of uh, yep. sand, uh, sand on top. And it's, it's never, it's the work's never decreased. Mm -hmm. It just changes. So I learned early on like that there's going to be a day and you know, you know, if God took a day off, it's okay for me to take a day off. And he wants us to. Mm -hmm. He wants us to take time off to, for balance. So the way I balance my life, and my teacher balances it, is that now that I'm retired from teaching, I am movie director while she's teaching at school. She's still teaching. But when she's off, that's off time for us. So my working hours as a film director are the same as her teaching hours. Mm. We have our time off together from like 5.30 to 10.30. And then I'll jump back on my band director, um, movie director hat after she's gone to bed and to sleep and get in a couple more hours and then start the whole thing over. But then we always are committed to taking a day off on the weekend, whether it's Saturday or Sunday. That's good. 
uh, so what are having been in this industry for a while? What are some of the bigger mistakes that film directors or actors maybe make, and how do you think we can go move away from that? So uh, the first thing I'd say for filmmakers early on, the biggest mistake many of them make is blowing off the importance of sound. Oh, they yeah. focus all on fo the picture. And then don't budget anything for sound design afterwards. Oh yeah, we'll you know we'll find somebody to do it. That kind of an attitude. Mm -hmm. And I challenge you to watch a movie with bad sound and tell me that you enjoy it. It'll kill it right away. Or sit through it. At, oh, at you most. can't. You yeah, can't. You yeah. can't. Uh, I think um, you know Ryan Giesman, the professor here, who's uh, uh, one of my uh, you know my closest partner in filmmaking. Uh, he's been my right-hand man on both filling in and calf rope, and I hope to continue to work with him. Um, I, I, I think he's the one that tells his students that I challenge you to leave the room, uh, and if the sound goes out, tell me what's going on. You can't. You need that sound, to, even if it's just doors closing or you hear a car running or whatever. You, this, you have no idea what's going on if you don't have the sound on. Right. So what, what are some of the bigger mistakes that maybe actors make? Um, I, I, I coach actors mm -hmm. uh, that are looking to get into TV and film. I, I coach on-camera acting. Very different from theatrical acting. Yes. Um, the biggest mistake I see them making is being too anxious to have a reel, samples of their work. Mm. It's, and I've learned early on, it's much better to have a no reel than a bad reel because you can't unsee a bad reel. Yes. So, so um, they need to wait until they have professional content and uh, then put it together real and not do, you know, uh, clips from high school or or then right. just sitting up their iPhone and doing a monologue or anything like that. You can't unsee it. And as a director, I get reels to me all the time and I will not watch an actor's reel a second time. There's no time to do it. Yeah. You know, there's too many people that want to act. So you got to be patient. I mean, I acted for 15 years on camera and never got a reel done, and it didn't stop me from getting cast. <laughs> you know, part of it was my demographic being an older male uh, and where at my age, uh, a lot of people went into acting and had either given up or had really made it big time. Mm -hmm. um, and so starting off in my professionally in my 50s, I had a lot of opportunities. Um, so there was... No need to have a real word got out that yeah he knows what he's doing. That's cool. Uh, so what are some of the bigger mistakes that students of you of yours had made? Trying to make a real too soon. Oh, okay, just another that, one. That's 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 a, that's, a, that's the big mistake is being impatient with uh, their careers, wanting everything to happen too fast. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I had a student of mine who is really developing some skills, but wasn't patient about their career. Moved to New York City way too early, being too young to where they're, you're competing against actors who started as kids and now the are going to get all the roles. Levels yeah, the at highest levels. Yeah, highest levels. So all that actor was able to get was background extra work. And if he had stayed here, he could have gotten more training and uh, more opportunity for you know speaking parts and lead roles uh, here before going there. So I think a lot of actors make the mistake of Trying to go to a big pond too quick and being a little minnow that gets eaten. You know, I would advise him to stay in a small pond and be a big fish here. And this area is developing. Oh, for sure. You it, know. This is one of the fastest developing arts area. Most definitely. In the country almost. Yeah, it, it is. It's sort of like uh, Portland East Coast. You know, uh, Portland is very artsy now as gotcha. well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and... Uh, so that's why I want to be part of that vanguard to improve the level of filmmaking here in our area. How do you know when you've gotten big enough to move to a bigger space? I have no interest in it. Okay, fair enough. You know, the only place, uh, I'm done with L.A. for sure. Mm -hmm. I would only go to L.A. for a premiere of one of my movies. Where I am tempted to spend some time is the Atlanta area. Because I've been yes. to several film festivals uh, for, with my films in Atlanta, area, the Atlanta region. There's Atlanta, and then there's a 50-mile radius around Atlanta of all these small towns that remind you of Pennsylvania. Yeah, and, and, and they're Atlanta, great. It's growing as well. It's becoming a more uh, close. It's a hub. That's where the hip-hop scene is at currently. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, uh, apparently. Huh. Um, 
But um, yeah, so Atlanta is another great spot. So I, whenever I hear of a young actor saying, I'm ready to go to L.A. or New York, I go, go out and visit it. But you owe yourself time in Atlanta to check out it, it seriously. Mm. Get an Airbnb, go down there for a couple of weeks. You're going to feel much more comfortable there being from Pennsylvania than in L.A. and New York. And you have far less competition. So last question. What, yeah. is, what is something that you know now? that you had wished you had known when you had first started your career. And this can be related to dadly. This can be as mm. a teacher, as a, as a father. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's, that's, uh, there's so much. There's so much. It's hard to pick one thing because the older we get, we all would love to go back and be, uh, I don't know. I wouldn't want to be 17 again. No, thank you. Mm-hmm. But I would have known so much more than I do now. Um, and I think th- what I most want to share with you today is, um, to trust God. I mean, uh, the, uh, my spiritual growth has grown so much more in these last 10 years as a filmmaker than it did when I first became a Christian at 21, that period from 21 to 55, I grew much slower as a Christian than I had these last 10 years. Uh, and a lot of that spiked. I believe by design where this is not an easy industry to get into. You've got to really want to do it and pray about it and trust God or else you're going to give up Mm -hmm. and it's not going to happen for you. So where can they find you and your films? Uh, Sorry. Where, where can people find you and your films? Follow, follow you. I'm uh, I may be an old guy, but I'm uh, very social media savvy. Uh, So I have an Instagram for uh, Bradley Hawkins. So Bradley underscore Hawkins uh, Dadly Productions just launched an Instagram in January, so it's new and fledgling. But that's where all of my content is going to start going. There are also Instagram pages for filling in and calf rope. So I'm kind of navigating all that to Dadly Productions in the future. Uh, Facebook. I'm not on Twitter any longer. I, 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 right now, I've, uh, I'm having to handle this all on my own. I'm looking forward to hiring a social media person mm-hmm. to take that all off my lap. Uh, but yeah, you'll find me on Facebook and uh Several Facebook pages, Dadley, Bradley, each film. You're going to find me if you want to. And definitely check out, uh, you have stuff on Amazon right now. Yes, right? Uh, yes. yeah. Uh, Roller Coaster and Filling In are both on Amazon right now. All right, well, with that said, this has been uh, Bradley Hawkins on the Story Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook.com forward slash The Story Corey Rosen. That's C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N. You can also search The Story Corey Rosen on all streaming platforms and find us there. And with all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.